Welcome to a meditation on love. With the purpose of discovering about the fear love dynamic. My own notion and problem with love is one derived from the problematics of systematic thought revolving around love as misused or under theorized in theory, in metaphysics. Not as an experience, but then also if it is misused as a theory, it is necessarily misused as praxis. This is the foundation of my own critical integral philosophy of feelings, from which the start requires a holistic integral approach to the topic of love and fear. And that approach begins with the assumption that oppression is already the background meta context for any philosophy, because a philosophy in the tradition of, say, for example, Socrates or Epicurus, where there has to be philosophizing with some higher purpose of both truth and thus freedom, with knowing truth, and that is a philosophy for the betterment of the human condition toward the expansion of human potential to its highest capabilities. And thus, a philosophy of human nature is essential to carve out to better identify the human condition to identify the dominion, the domination of oppression as its formative process in that shaping of the human condition. And thus, human nature offers some essential but not the only core references for health, sanity, and sustainability. Love is a worthy but not the only core aspect of that philosophical inquiry. And with that, fear is equally as worthy. This latter assumption being based on a long perennial tradition of dualistic, dialectic, and psychosocial observation of the interplay of love-fear dynamics, of which my latest appropriation of that is more concerned with the interplay of love, fearlessness, fear, a trialectic dynamics in living systems. That philosophical framework then argues that love and fear are not reducible to emotions or affect alone, but have to expand beyond that to metaphysics. And in doing so, the evidence is available to show that many positions, sorry, that many positions of love and fear held by different people as binary oppositions, these are core to the human meta-motivational experience but that there is no one and only agreed upon understanding of that dynamic. Note, my own problematizing of love discourses is to replace love within a philosophical framework and thus a critical praxis. A move in a somewhat similar way could be said to be done with politicizing framework, say for example the likes of Cornell West and his view on love. And in contrast to these two problematizing contexts is, say, for example, the teachings of Marianne Williamson, a point that is both relevant to today, especially in the history of the US presidential politics. The contrarian philosophical system. So from now on, I'm going to be looking at Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy, my own quick take on it regarding love. Arthur Schopenhauer has a fairly clear value ranking hierarchy that is founda very foundational to his philosophical system and not typically has this view historically and or is it received now very well, especially by Westerners, humanists, modernists, and North Americans. In that he posits truth, which for him and ought to be for humans universally, as the primary search, desire, and imprudent way to live an ethical life. Good life, some might say, like Socrates, the existentialists would argue as well. Not that Arthur Schopenhauer would ever have put those terms, good life, together. He would have seen that as an oxymoron, and not the direction to try to persuade humans to aim for. That is based on him not wishing to see humans enter the fallacy of pursuit of happiness as if it exists. Note, evidence in Arthur Schopenhauer's text shows he does not 
dismiss or make love absent, he merely puts it in its proper place philosophically. Continuing, simply truth trumps love in the Schopenhauer philosophical system. Philo, Sophie, love of wisdom, is precisely that unique sphere of study, inquiry, and methodologies that put wisdom over love, that is, truth over love, and it acts as a countering process to ensure humans are not led astray by love of love, hidden below which would be a formation of some spiritual metaphysics and religious theology of the abiding and overly familiar, aka love of God, equals in practice, God is love, which supposed does not, sorry, which supposed does and should trump all other aspects and or pursuits. That latter point, as Schopenhauer would argue, as an outnote atheist himself, would end up more or less into a kind of pathological narcissism of one kind or another, even if it could be shown to be so. In other words, my own words, love and love of love tendencies are primarily a philosophical distraction, a point that needs to be developed later. Part of the argumentation behind the above paragraph comes through in Schopenhauer's approach to evil and concomitantly to good, which may be analyzed theologically and philosophically, primarily ethically, as homologous and or at least analogous in attempting to define and make sense of reality, aka the human experience of existence. The quick overview gathered from one video talk I recently heard by a contemporary philosopher reading, quote, on the suffering of the world, and to quote by Schopenhauer. First point, in the words of Arthur Schopenhauer, when we look and speak the truth about existence, quote, life is a disappointment on the whole, end of quote, Schopenhauer says. And our feelings, if honestly examined, will show this to be the case, he argued. And the second point, regarding philosophy's role in psychological consolation, consolation in life, Schopenhauer admits most everyone will think upon hearing his philosophy that it is, quote, comfortless, end of quote because I speak the truth, Schopenhauer ends the quote. And typically, quote again, Schopenhauer, your university professors, I put in, and clergy, are bound to teach optimism, end the quote. Schopenhauer then goes on to say, because that is what you are seeking more so, and they know that, and in most instances are seeking it as well, and thus each gives the other in a codependency a regime of optimistic philosophical fantasies, fallacies, to console the soul's response to existence, to the real, capital R, as Lacan might say today. But as Schopenhauer goes deeper and argues, contra Leibniz, for example, that evil is not just the negation privation of good, Note, many argue, as does Marion Williamson and many esoteric philosophies, that fear is a privation of love. But not so for Arthur Schopenhauer. He rejects that and more or less equates will, capital W, with a form of evil, with life, capital L, designed in essential pain and suffering, and makes it thus a positive aspect, not a privation of some better aspect. In this latter case, if it were true, there is offered by the consoling philosophies and theologies a construction of evil or sin as a temporary vice, fluid and changeable, that can be quickly overcome by rational and heart-filled ethical choices and actions that are the virtues. At least, not ontologically, Schopenhauer would argue, can that pre-given design of life and will be altered? Although he has some modifiable variations, actually hard-won consolations, to will's great suffering imperative in this latter east-west philosophy. Yes, 
For Arthur Schopenhauer, there are no easy one consolations. Example, like love, goodness in existence. They are only manufactured and ephemeral, he would argue, in our species, ultimately failing horribly in their high aims and expectations that accompany them. So best be very judicious in their usage, he would argue. Evil is positive, good is negative, and so would love be negative in his system. By negative, they are not the ordinary, not the, but only the extraordinary, which may appear when the will is denied or renounced through intense and ritual-like practices, which may then bring some consolation. He argues overall in quantitative terms that there is in this real a voluminous domination of pain and suffering above pleasure and non-suffering. So to be ethically aligned with the nature of existence, we will suffer less if we accept this, what some call a pessimistic outlook as positive, rather than as usual trying to make it wrong and replace it with a supposed positive outlook, example, optimism and hope and love. My own fearlessness psychology is a negative psychology itself, much along the Schopenhauerian lines of argumentation, albeit I developed my psychology along a philosophy of feelings, much more enriched and multi-dimensioned than Schopenhauer, but that has yet to be all fully articulated. I'll end this short meditation on love with this last section I'm calling Schopenhauer's Theory of Sympathy. Sorry, this is a very short piece. I'm just beginning to get into it and what sympathy might mean. Most everyone has studied the man and the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer and has known that he had a fairly normal socialization in his youth. With some definite traumas in family and in the society at the time, and his own penchant for deep thought and reflection led him into study and writing to the point where he became further and further isolated and alone, to an extreme, according to any normal standards of healthy relations. As a deep thinker myself, I can relate, albeit I have taken a life course to mostly my good fortune to have had many ongoing long-term relationships of varied kinds, but at heart, I do feel very alone in my intellectual and soul world. Relationships with humans are typically more a pain than not at some level of my deepest nature. I find the most consolation in my relationships with nature, as did Schopenhauer, in particular with his pet dogs. I believe Schopenhauer, like myself, are highly sympathetic creatures, not well adaptable to cultural existence. I have a footnote there on cultural existence. Qualifying cultural in caps here is very conscious and fits my own theory of human existence as a dynamic result of the interrelationships, harmonious and in conflict, of the natural, cultural, and spiritual realms. Unfortunately, without this triad, I believe Schopenhauer conflated them and his own philosophy and his life suffers unnecessarily with its error due to no triadic distinctions. Thus, his pessimism is very related to but different than my own, which I am now labeling his and mine a bitter philosophy, which is first and foremost, yet that does not exclude by any necessity a better component. I'll finish with the last paragraph of this meditation. Clearly in all his work, Arthur Schopenhauer doesn't mention love very much at all. When he does, there are interesting things that appear that I will pursue. I am just barely beginning to inquire into something Arthur Schopenhauer said. I'm citing here from Edwards Schuth, 2014. 
Schopenhauer does not explicitly state that relationships are necessary and have potential towards good. I believe that Schopenhauer would support my claim for the need of relationships when he states that, quote, all true and pure affection is sympathy or compassion, and all love that is not sympathy is selfishness. Schopenhauer provides a unique theory because of his pessimistic yet deeply sympathetic attitude towards life. It is as if he had described the world to be an abundance of coal with a gleaming diamond just below the surface.